Okay, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on uh, where you're joining us uh, around the world for this uh, very exciting uh, event. Uh, so my name is Isabelle Poupard, I'm the Deputy Head of Mission here at the Embassy of Canada in Berlin, and I'm delighted to moderate this uh, scene setter. Um, joining us virtually, um, I hope they are there already, uh, we have uh, Agnès Calamar, uh, uh, who is the Secretary General of Amnesty International. We have uh, Patricia Peña, who is the Director General for Foreign Policy at Global Affairs Canada. Uh, she, ah, there, here they are. <laughs> Patricia is joining us from Ottawa at a very early hour. We're very grateful. Et bienvenue, Agnès, merci de vous joindre à nous. And with me, uh, on stage live, uh, I have Enid Mutani Diga, who is the Senior Vice President of the Global Legal Program at the Center for Reproductive Rights. I very much uh, look forward to our uh, discussion. Uh, and before uh, we start, uh, we are delighted uh, to have a, a, video, uh, from a video message from uh, the Deputy Minister for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights of Mexico, uh, Mrs. Marta Delgado Peralta. So if we could have the video Okay. Good morning, everyone. I am Marta Delgado, Under Secretary for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights in the Mexican Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I am delighted to be part of the first ever summit on feminist foreign policy. First of all, I would like to thank the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy and the Embassy of Canada in Germany for co-hosting this summit. I recognize the commitment of all the participants to advance toward a progressive and comprehensive feminist agenda that benefits all women, adolescents and girls uh, in all their diversity. Mexico believes that this meeting strengthens the synergies between government, civil society, academia, youth and the private sector in order to promote the feminist perspective in foreign policy. With the adoption of a feminist foreign policy in 2020, Mexico became the first developing state to promote a feminist perspective in its foreign policy. With this commitment, we hope to position Mexico as a relevant player that supports gender equality and the human rights of all women, adolescents and girls at a multilateral forum and our bilateral and regional relations. For us, the gender perspective should be an essential component in an all international agendas to ensure the participation of all women and girls in the building of sustainable and equal world that we want to achieve for uh, 2030. Mexico defines its feminist foreign policy as a set of principles that seek from the foreign policy arena to guide government actions with the aim of reducing and eliminating structural difference gaps and gender inequalities to build a more unjust and prosperous society. The added value of our feminist foreign policy is that Mexico includes the gender and intersectional perspective in all areas of Mexican foreign policy. Mexico makes visible the contribution of the women to the foreign policy actions and also our country provides coherence and congruence to both domestic and international government actions. The struggle for gender equality must be based on listening to the voices of all women and all vulnerable groups. And uh, Mexico is developing uh, new strategies as a developing countries which can contribute to changing the rules that oppress us as women, adolescents uh, and girls. The value of a feminist foreign policy is also that it contributes significantly uh, to national development. Our country understands that uh, it is a state's responsibility to provide all the proper normative, institutional, financial and human tools to progress towards the rights and liberties that women and girls deserve. 
In the sense, the feminist struggle for gender equality has been a pioneer model towards the immense emancipation of uh, most vulnerable groups in our society. The government of Mexico is feminist and uh, our foreign policy is too. So therefore, we will not backtrack on these efforts despite the atmosphere of polarization and resistance to gender equality that we are facing, as, we, as you know, as human rights of women and girls are non-negotiable. Gender equality is a good for humanity and a human right and a condition for peaceful, prosperous and sustainable world that we want. And we are convinced of these principles too. I wish you all the best uh, at this meeting, uh, whose results in undoubtedly reinforce our respective uh, feminist foreign policies to the benefit for women, worlds, and societies as a whole. And I thank you very much for the opportunity of this uh, participation and the involvement of uh, on these discussions. We are going to be aware of the participation of other countries that are undertaking this uh, kind of uh, feminist foreign policies and to learn from your experience. Thank you so much. Okay, so we are very grateful uh, to uh, Undersecretary Delgado for joining us virtually this morning and to Mexico for the support and of course uh, the foreign, uh, feminist foreign policy uh, agenda that we all share. Thank you. So let's move on to our uh, panel, um, the scene setting uh, panel, which is uh, very important. Um, I turn first to Agnès Calama. Uh, we, are for, we are, of course, all uh, very familiar with the work of uh, Amnesty uh, International. Um, but um, in the case of the pan this panel, I think we very much uh, look forward to hearing uh, from you about the connection between human rights and a feminist uh, foreign policy agenda. So, Agnès, c'est à vous. Merci. Agnès, on ne vous entend pas. Ah, oh, voilà, parfait. Oui, allez-y. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be joining you today. And um, uh, I'm very sorry I could not be with you. Um, there is a bit of an echo for me, so it's not uh, straightforward. I'll try to... Thank you. Okay, that's better. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, in order to set the tone, I think we need to begin by um, highlighting really the state of the world. Uh, it, it is probably at its ever worse since we uh, came out of uh, World War II in 1948. A crumbling international infrastructures, brutal nationalism, inequalities in death and life, and human rights betrayed on many fronts. And many of the crises that we are confronting right now, almost a perfect storm of crises from historical systemic one to more punctual ones, are deeply gendered, sexualized, racialized, characterized by unique disproportionate impact on, on women and girls. The COVID-19 pandemic magnified all of those. It exposed with brutal clarity the deep-seated inequalities and it revealed the brokenness too of our multilateral system. Vaccine nationalism was just one of many other examples of the broken system. The unlawful death of refugees and migrants at the gate of the Western world. Afghans and Afghan women left behind, clinging to planes. Palestinians left to find, fight alone for a shrinking geography. These and many more crises demonstrate over and over again that race, gender, 
sex are hardwired into our international system. It is evident in whom that system does and does not rescue. It is evident in whom it declares a victim and who it ignores. It is evident in whom that international system will mourn death and which death are ignored. It is evident in whose lives matter and whose life just does not. And women's, girls' lives are historically not included in those that matter. Maternal mortality, unsafe abortion, thousands, maybe millions of women killed every year by laws that do not value their equal right to life. Slow death because of lack of education, lack of economic opportunities, because of a, a, a denial of equal right to citizenship, because of high poverty rate, gender-based violence, denial of autonomy. In some countries, women are living at second-class citizen. These are historical. They are systemic. These are what we have fought for decades, centuries, with some success, some failures. These are coming on top of what we have to confront now over the last decade, which has seen many setbacks expressed in the so-called growing anti-gender movement, intent on undoing some of the progresses made on women's rights over the last couple of decades, including on sexual and reproductive health and rights, including on LGBT rights, including on trans rights. It was devastating to see Turkey exit last year from the Istanbul Convention based on nonsensical claims about so-called family values, those same claims that we find over and over again expressed in many countries around the world. Russia's aggression of Ukraine coming after some 20 years of undermining of the international legal system is just one more additional obstacle to the equal realization of our right, but not, not just an obstacle. It's a major crisis coming on top of the climate crisis, coming on top of the inequality crisis so deeply revealed by COVID, the product of a butch response to the 2008 financial system. What all of those are demanding is a reshaping of the international system, of international relations, of the place of the human in that system. And frankly, right now, we're not going in that direction. I've heard a reference to Build Back Better. I'm sorry, but opposite has happened over the last year. We have built back worse. So the empty slogans are not a way of moving forward. They are bringing us backward. We have been exposed again and again to the failure of international institutions. We are now facing repeated allegations of double standard regarding the Western world uh, answer to Ukraine. And that undermine whether they are real or perceived those double stand standards deeply undermine the necessity of global solidarity and global stand against Russia's aggression, deeply undermine any kind of meaningful reply, response we will take, we will make, or we can make to climate crisis, to other crises in Ethiopia, Palestine, and so on. So the question we must ask ourselves, as feminists, as people fighting patriarchy, racism, a racialized international system, is can we re-envisage, recreate, re-establish a new world order, a new international system with human rights protection, with protection of women and girls, with intersectional protection at the center? Of that new world order without waiting for world war three 
or more Holocaust. The question we must ask ourselves is what would be a 1948 UDHR-like response to today's calamity? Of course, we cannot turn back to 1948, and we have learned since then. So we must reinvent a 1948 response that is adapted to the realities of our world. The current multiple crisis we are confronting, historical, systemic, and punctual, demand that we adapt feminist lenses to the foreign policy of state that are historically responsible for many of the crises we are confronting. But that won't be enough. Through the critique of foreign policy, we must critique and question power. We, of course, need to promote gender justice and discrimination and oppression. We must allow for a path forward to be built around which many more can rally around. Many people can rally around. Critiquing, addressing patriarchy, racism, colonial legacies. That is a necessity for the path forward, but we cannot do that through empty slogans. It's got to be deep. It's got to really interrogate how we work how we respond to accusation of double standard, for instance, how we demonstrate with the Western world that we are prepared to fight for Ethiopia the same way we are prepared to fight for Ukrainian, that we are prepared to fight for Palestinians equally. We need much more than feminist foreign policy. We need feminist approaches to governance, to government, to domestic policies, to diplomacy, to development, to humanitarian aid, to migration. And we need, of course, the resources, and that has been mentioned. So what should a 1948 generation do when confronting the crisis of 2022? That is what we need to ask ourselves. And of course, part of that response is that we must be feminist. We must be intersectional. We must be LGBT trans focus. We must stand against racism and patriarchy. But we must understand and confront the root causes of all the crises we are confronting. And those root causes are in many of the countries from which the movement is born. And that, to me, is a key question, a key issue, a key challenge for us all. To be meaningful, to be authentic, we must question deeply, critically, the power we hold and how we exhibit it, how we express it, how we deliver it, how we use it to protect people equally the world over. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Agnès Calamar, for uh, a sobering, very sobering assessment, uh, and yet a resounding call to action. Uh, if anything, I think your intervention this morning has uh, uh, increased our resolve, our commitment uh, to do something to uh, reshape our world, as you have uh, put it. I turn now to Patricia Peña. Uh, my colleague at Foreign Affairs Canada, Global Affairs Canada. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia, for joining us. Um, we would like to hear from you about uh, what a feminist foreign policy um, looks like in practice from Canada. Over to you. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be with you. Um, uh, as Isabel mentioned, it's very early in Ottawa at this time, um, and I would have very much liked to be uh, with you in person, um, but uh, I'm very excited that this is taking place um, and uh, seeing the range of different participants, both in person um, and at a distance, gives me hope. 
so your question was, um, what does a feminist foreign policy uh, look like in our organization and in our country? Um, so for Canada, uh, this has really been a process and a journey over the past six years. Um, we've implemented policies, programs and initiatives across all the areas of our international engagement. This includes trade, this includes diplomacy, peace and security efforts, our economic relations, and very importantly, our international assistance. Um, and we've really um, incrementally developed this and deepened it through a series of policies. Uh, one of our signature policies has been the feminist international assistance policy, um, which really gave us an opportunity to prioritize support for um, feminist movements and women's rights organizations through a number of different initiatives. One particularly important one was the Women's Voice and Leadership uh, Program, um, where the, well, another dimension is our work on women, peace and security. We're currently in the process of developing the third national action plan on women, peace and security. We have a trade diversification strategy that not only looks at economic measures, but looks at who participates in trade um, and the depth of that and how we can share the prosperity across a wider range of persons. Um, and really across all of that, we do gender-based analysis, what we call gender-based analysis plus, GBA plus. For us, this is beyond being something about women and girls. It's about how do we include all people in all their diversity, taking an intersectional lens to try and ask the right questions. It's about um, a, an objective, but it's also about a process. And so how we set up these initiatives, how we implement them, how we conceive them is as important as the final outcome. It's not an, a document that we're seeking to do. And maybe if, um, you know, I, I close on kind of two comments. Um, the other aspect of this is not just doing out there, but actually changing how we operate as an organization. So we need to walk the talk. And so as a foreign ministry, we're looking very carefully about how we operate structural power relation issues, even in our own organization. Um, uh, we have an anti-racism strategy. Uh, we have issues around ensuring that we have a diverse workforce and that we are inclusive in our processes. And my second comment um, is, I think it's very telling that I am here coming to you. I'm the Director General responsible for all of our strategic foreign policy. This is not something that's being advanced within a sectoral unit for instance, our just you know our human rights group, um, or a uh, a particular part of our department, it sits across everything, and it is my responsibility as a person who helps to guide and inform our foreign policy to integrate a feminist approach throughout all of it. I think that this is telling, and it shows the depth of our commitment. Um, we are looking to learn and collaborate with other countries listen to civil society. I'm excited that Germany is down this path. The three R's plus the D, these are also included in our approach. And it's a process, as I mentioned, we'll continue to learn and adapt our approach um, as, as we seek to implement it. And that ability to listen and to be humble is part of an integral part of our approach. So thank you very much, uh, Patricia. Uh, I can assure you that here in Berlin, you have strong supporters at the embassy uh, to assist with the implementation of the feminist foreign policy. Thank you. Uh, and now I turn to uh, my co-panelists here uh, in the room, Inid uh, Mutani uh, Diga, uh, who will uh, talk to us about why it should be a focus, uh, there should be, sorry, a focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, as part of a feminist foreign policy. Why is it so critical? Um, thank you. Um, and I'd, I'd like to start by congratulating the governments that have taken this bold step um, in having um, a, foreign, uh, a feminist foreign policy. And of course, um, congratulate the Center for Foreign Policy, um, Feminist Foreign Policy for this summit but also for taking the bold step to, um, to push forward and to keep um, governments accountable and to also bring in civil society. But what does it have to do with sexual reproductive health and rights? I'd like to say everything. 
And I'd like to start by giving us a short story. Um, I come from Kenya, and uh, you know, in the, most of the growing up, the first story about, I heard about um, sexual reproductive health and rights and power was when we were told about this specific community because in, um, we've got all these um, stories about where communities came from and power, and most of them about men being in power. But there was one particular community which had women in power. And the story is told that um, when the men met to ask how they could take over power from the women, they decided they're going to make all the women pregnant. And this is a, a book that I remember reading and seeing illustrations of many women um, pregnant, and that for me has been what, um, what is the, the vision that I have of how do you take away power from people is by really getting to the very personal space. So SRHR is about getting to the personal space. It's about asking um, how do you move from the public, which is where the policies are made, to the private, when you talk about gender-based violence, to the personal level where you talk about choices and decisions and bodily autonomy, because SRHR is about the bodies. So it's not about just having a good policy and having a good story, it's about the body of a person. And for me, why it is important is because unless we talk about sexual reproductive health and policy, we are seeking um, to remove the politics that have already been put on women's and persons of diverse gender, politics have been put on their body as a way of controlling them and taking away power. So no matter how good the policies are, no matter how good um, we seek to remove systemic imbalances, no matter how good we seek to put opportunities to participate, this cannot happen if, we are going to, if um, people's bodies and the only thing that is the resource that takes you to participate in those spaces and to take power is actually uh, interfered with. So really for us at the Center for uh, Reproductive Rights, we look at sexual reproductive health and rights as the most fundamental right that is going to enable women and girls and other vulnerable groups to take any opportunities or to achieve any outcomes that we put out there. And so for me, uh, I would actually go as far as saying, um, really, the measure of how good a, a feminist foreign policy is going to be is how much they integrate sexual reproductive health and policy, not just in the policies themselves, but in how they are going to be implemented and how they are going to be achieved. Um, and just to mention that um, at the center, how do we see, um, or what recommendations do we put forward to actually get this in action? And to start off with, um, and many actors have talked about this, we know that there's a serious attack on the actual framework that really seeks to safeguard uh, sexual reproductive health and policy from the international level, the human rights framework, to the national level, to the local level, and to actually to the personal spaces. So really the first, um, the first point um, of entry is for those governments that are pushing forward this policy, the, those governments that believe in this policy to really be also on the forefront. And you know most of the, those governments, Canada, Sweden, are actually on the forefront of safeguarding that space, including at the global level, and that must continue. We've seen very concerted efforts by um, anti-rights, um, anti-feminist governments really um, convening for the very first time and actually um, trying to remove language in international documents that seek to safeguard that space. We've seen them suggesting language remove commitment. So that must continue to be um, the premise of governments that are pushing the feminist foreign policy. Um, foreign policy. Secondly, um, we also think that, um, and this has, again has been mentioned, that the, the role of... Uh, human rights defenders, and especially women's human rights defenders, must be relooked at in aspect of sexual reproductive health and rights and redefined. As we work at the center, we are seeing, um, and of course, we really um, applaud um, our sisters and other actors who are really pushing in this space, whether it's around gender-based violence or women in conflict, but really there are other classes of women's human rights defenders that get left out. We are increasingly seeing doctors who provide abortion being arrested and, har and, and harassed. We are increasingly seeing pharmacists being um, harassed. We are increasingly seeing communities, organizations, women's movement that are providing or seeking to give networks to people who are trying to access sexual health and rights, including in Ukraine right now, being targeted and being threatened. And a lot of time, the threats are even couched around uh, sexual violence. 
So really, um, we must also look at how do we define, as, you know, as, as, um, as, as, as Anya talked about, this is, not, this is not 1948. So we also must be every morning wake up trying to redefine. As more threats come up, we have to redefine what does it mean to be a human rights defender in the current crisis um, and in the, in the face of the threats to gender, um, LGBTQ rights, and also to SRHR. Um, the third one is that we also must, um, we also think governments must put political capital um, to, to, the, to, to, to the conversation around feminist foreign policy. I really liked a comment that was made yesterday by my sister uh, from Afghanistan when they talked about, you know, um, you must put those conversations in the politics themselves. When governments sit around the table, you know, not just about the numbers of the many men meeting to discuss, you know, um, about peace building and 1325, but even when you talk about governments putting in place policies, we must also have political conversations and say, what does that mean to issues of sexual reproductive health and rights? What does it mean if you're going to sit around a table with governments that are increasingly um, using women's bodies as, as, as tools of war? That must be a conversation that is taken up by progressive governments as the ones that have started this journey on a feminist foreign policy. Um, then the, th the fourth one, um, and I think this is the most uh, challenging one, is that we also must walk the talk. I've had this, since, this said since yesterday, but, and, I've, and um, I also like the fact that most of the government's um, representatives have stood here today, they've said they also have work to do at home, but I think we must start, um, and Christina, I'm really hoping that we guard against the idea of a feminist foreign policy becoming another buzzword. I know the minister talked about you know, the giggles, but for me, one of the fears that I have is that it becomes another buzzword for any government that wants to look nice. So can we have at least minimum standards for any government that wants to purport to have a feminist foreign policy? And each of some of those standards must include guarding women's bodies, guarding the bodies of people of diverse gender who also have reproductive rights. Because unless we do that, it doesn't matter how much um, you give opportunities for women to sit in tables if they cannot leave their houses feeling safe, if they cannot leave their houses without, being, without their bodies being used to abuse them and insult them and use their sexuality as a weapon against them. Um, then I'd also just like to mention um, very briefly on the question of humanitarian settings. We congratulate governments that put a lot of funds um, to respond to crisis, uh, funding the minimum initial service package, but we would also want governments to take the bold step of asking what is in that package. A lot of um, the civil society carries that message, and we've seen governments that even put policies in place that say our resources cannot be used for certain things, including safe abortion, which means uh, if the most of the most the bigger funders, some of some of these services, including US, put those kind of um, put those kind of uh, um, you know barriers in place, it means that um, service providers are going to start looking at the package and removing essential services, including um, abortion pills, including um, uh, as, um, emergency contraceptive, because they want to be able to access funds. So really, for me, I think I think my time is up. For me, is to say that. The, the feminist foreign uh, policy must safeguard the body. And by doing that, we must be able to provide for uh, sexual reproductive health and rights as a fundamental right. And that must be a minimum for any government that wants to put that policy in place. Thank you. Uh, in need for uh, these uh, uh, remarks, bringing us uh, to the personal uh, level uh, that's very uh, important in terms of what uh, we try to uh, achieve. Um, uh, thank you to the three of you for uh, these very wide-ranging opening remarks. Uh, I think it's a very uh, wonderful uh, scene setter. Um, I'm told we still have five minutes. Uh, and I would not want to miss uh, this opportunity to ask uh, the three of you one question, um, which is related to the importance of uh, public support for uh, advancing progressive politics. Um, so the question is, how can we attract 
public interest? How can we increase public interest, uh, counter the skeptics, uh, and involve men in supporting a feminist foreign policy? So I turn first to Agnes uh, Kalama. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Look, I'm going to place a section in a global context, if it's okay with you. Um, and I've already made reference to the fact that um, there are a, a, a lot of allegations, accusations of double standard leveled at um, the Western world uh, at the moment. I'm just from a three weeks, uh, four weeks mission to Africa, I've met with a lot of people during that visit. And I have to say that was a key message from everywhere, civil society to government. And that to me is a major challenge to a feminist foreign policy, uh, particularly originating from the Western world, but I will say for Mexico as well. How do we convince a global public that feminism is not again tool of the Western world to advance an ideological framework that will benefit certain people over the others? And I think I gave the answer to that uh, response. You know, I mean, it, it's it's much more. It will take much more time. Um, but feminist foreign policy for me must begin by acknowledging the equal right and the equal value of everybody. Yes, of course, the Russian aggression is of a magnitude and a seriousness that, you know, stand out. I have absolutely no doubt about it under international law and so on. But that is not a message that goes through in Africa or in Asia very well. And that is reflected, by the way, in the latest um, UN General Assembly resolution on the uh, on Russia. You know, the, the numbers were not that great. So uh, it's not about the seriousness of, of the aggression and what it means for the international system and international law. It is how the Western world in particular protect people equally, how it cares for people equally, how it is prepared to go the extra mileage to demonstrate it and to act on it, how it is prepared to go and visit African states right now. None of them have done that, by the way. The last thing I've heard yesterday was that we're going to punish the African states that have not voted um, properly at the last uh, General Assembly resolution. That is not the way we should conduct foreign policy, feminist or otherwise, by the way. If we want to create global solidarity to protect the Ukrainian people, as we should to protect the Ethiopian or indeed the Palestinian, we need to put <laughs> our act alongside our words. We need to go and visit. Some of you need to go and visit the African continent, talk to the people, talk to the governments who do not want to stand by your side in the fight against Russia. Yes. Demonstrate equal commitment and rally around um, a global crisis the world over. That is how we're going to win public opinion around a common stand on global solidarity for all crises. Thank you. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Great. Um, so uh, this is a key so question. Is a key question. Um, um, I'm sure you I'm have sure all you heard, have the heard the comment. Uh, I'm, not feminist, I'm not a feminist, or a hesitation or to use the word. the word. We're all here because, We're all here we, because believe we believe very strongly, strongly in, in using the word using feminist the word because. It is at the core of some of the challenges we want to address. So how do we win public support? I mean, I think the COVID-19 pandemic 
has been horrific. It has affected people around the world, but it has also shown in a very clear way um, how taking a feminist approach um, can really help us to understand issues. Um, and so, for instance, both you know within Canada, um, looking at the differentiated health, social, economic impacts of the crisis. I mean, it is very clear to to people that um, women are overrepresented in fr as frontline health workers, for example. Um, but the but the associated risks and and greatest harms have experienced been experienced by uh, disproportionately by certain members of our population. And so I think that has created some space for a dialogue that connects our domestic with our international, that helps to inform the efforts that we're doing about um, vaccine equity. Um, and we're not there yet, and we have to do more, as Agnes reminds us. But I think really bringing home those examples and sharing them and, and fostering a dialogue. You know, data is really valuable. If you tell people that states that are more gender equal are less prone to, to conflict and to violence, and that, that when there is peace, that it is more sustainable and it is more resilient, that we have data to show that, I think that's very valuable. Um, and, you know, the, the smart economics, I'm a bit hesitant to refer to that as, as kind of one of those aspects of that question, but it is true. Um, uh, you know, funding that, that and programs and efforts to eliminate gender-based violence actually help to improve the overall health and economy of a country. You know, a percentage of GDP um, is very valuable um, as, as a way of conveying it. So I think we still need to talk about human rights, and that's at the very foundation. We need to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. That is core to our approaches. But when you scratch away at the surface and you get beyond the, the title, um, citizens understand because their own lived experiences reflect these issues. And as Agnes has very clearly said, we need to draw the connector points between what we're doing at home with what we're doing abroad um, and, and uh, engage in those discussions. And then we will be able to bring people along with us. It is a long process. It's not going to change overnight, but it is absolutely possible. Thank you very much. Enid? Um, I think just to add on to what my two colleagues have said, uh, which I, you know, I fully agree with, I think I think part of that is already what this summit is seeking to do, really moving this conversation to also include um, civil society, to include other actors who are not um, around the table when the feminist, when the foreign policies are being made. But I think the other critical aspect of it is really illustrating the relevance of these policies to the people who are mostly impacted and how that's going to happen is really connecting with the movements as to the level where this policy also impact outside our relevant um, countries. So for me, I would say, you know, connections with the strong movements, um, whether they are feminist movements, um, they're also strong movements that are intersectional. So that brings out the aspect of just working beyond um, groups that are working with women's rights issues. So looking at um, groups working on uh, migration, groups working on LGBTQI uh, um, issues, looking at groups that are already finding nice, you know, um, sustainable ways of working with uh, bringing men to the table to work around gender issues, and there are many of those across the world. So I'd really say it's about extending the conversation and, and, and getting the movement on the table and to understand how this also uh, um, really moves their agenda as well. And I think, it, it, I think it's also important that um, we find ways of also getting these conversations to the countries where the foreign policy also goes to, so that civil society there also picks on the conversation as a way of also pushing their governments when they get that, uh, you know, whether it's when they get the, the, the into the conversations to also make it part of their agenda to have similar um, similar standards or similar um, thinking around, you know, the feminist um, approach. Um, so that's what I would like to to mention. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I will end this uh, first setting, scene setting session um, by reading uh, the first question we have received in the chat, which is how many countries have officially adopted a feminist foreign policy? Well, I'm told nine. So the comments goes on, these countries should be congratulated and other countries 
particularly rich countries, should be pressured to do so? So that was the first question today. Please join me in thanking very warmly our uh, panelists for today. Thank you very much for your participation.